Good morning. It is so great to be with you all this morning. Uh, just a couple announcements really quick right before we get started. Our church is hosting a blood drive on September 24th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. If you're healthy and would like to donate blood, you can schedule an appointment at redcrossblood.org, or you can also call the church office at 517-625-3400 to schedule an appointment as well. We also want you to invite you to participate in our church-wide daily Bible reading. Um, text the word Bible to 517-625-3400, or you can contact us through the Contact Us link on the website um, at perrynazarene.com. And if, then if you'd like to give online, you can also do that at our website by clicking the Give link. Um, we are so glad to have you with us this morning. If you'd um, stand with us if you want to, or you can remain seated however you'd like to join us for worship this morning. But would you join us as we worship together? to be in your presence with your people singing praises I love to stand and rejoice lift my hands and raise my voice you set my feet to dancing you fill my heart with song you give me reason to rejoice so good to be gathered together in the presence of the Lord. Would you take a second and turn to your neighbor, um, give them a wave or uh, an air hug, however you would like to greet. And if you're joining us online, would you just let us know you're um, watching with us? And we are just so glad to have you. Let's continue worshiping together this morning. shake and crumble at your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry Your name, angels above. 
chapter 86 says, For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. As we sing this next song, um, it's called The Heart of Worship, and it came out of a, um, a worship pastor and a pastor um, recognizing that their church was just going through the motions of worship. And so um, I think they went for a year, but it might, have, it might not have been that long, but they went for a extended time period with um, no instruments um, and like no live music. They did a cappella um, to really press into the heart of worship. Um, so I want to, you to imagine that experience as we sing. Obviously we do have instruments, but kind of just focus in on you worshiping this morning. Um, and as we sing, some of the lyrics say, when the music fades, all is stripped away and I simply come. And then it says, you search much deeper within. You're looking into my heart. Good music, catchy beats, talented musicians, even the friends and loved ones with whom we worship. These are all good things and wonderful in the context of corporate worship. And yet when we focus on them rather than Jesus, we are losing the heart in our worship. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John 4, 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The essence of worship is not the many good externals, but heart and head, spirit and truth. Our spirit stirred by the Holy Spirit in worship over true things about God, his son, and the gospel. What's essential for worship today is not music and microphone, but the truth about Jesus and the help of his spirit. The heart of worship is our heart, delighting in Jesus and expressing praise to him for the true things the scripture teaches us about who he is and what he has accomplished for us. It is then all about Jesus, not us. It involves us, but we're at the periphery. He's at the center. Jesus is the focus. It's his commands we consider first, not our preferences. This song is all about refocusing and recentering and reminding ourselves why we worship and who we worship. The heart of worship is not music and song, but heads and hearts in joyful awe of the real Jesus. Would you join me this morning as we worship in awe of Jesus and who he is? Words. No one could express how much 
whatever posture you are most comfortable in for prayer. Psalm 27 says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Heavenly Father, help us to cultivate the simplicity of devotion to you. We want you to be our primary ambition in life. We desire to behold your beauty and dwell in your house all the days of our lives. Let seeking your heart be the goal of our lives, even in busy and stressful times. Help us to be ones who seek after your beauty. Help us to discover your emotions and the purposes of your heart. We want to be lovers of God and thirst after you daily. Teach us how to align our hearts with yours. We recommit ourselves as followers after your heart. We choose to seek your face. In difficult times, open our hearts to receive your revelation. Hide us in the shelter of your tabernacle. Reveal deeply to our hearts your love for us. Rescue us in the midst of difficult circumstances and bring us into a spacious place. Teach us to enjoy life the way you desire. We choose to be confident in your love. We love you, Lord, our strength. We give you today and all that it holds. And we pray all of this in your precious son's name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you all here this morning. Good to have you those of you who are online. Uh, we are going to be able to have our 11 a.m. service outside. I think the weather's moved out. So uh, we'll look forward to uh, welcoming those who come. 
Well, we're going to look in this morning into the Gospel of John. Uh, the Gospel of John, one of the great, all the great books in the Bible. Uh, for September and October, we are going to be studying uh, the Gospel of John. Um, then in the first part of November, we're going to look at the letters that John wrote, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then on this, I think it's the Sunday before Thanksgiving, uh, we are going to begin a, uh, looking at the book of Revelation. I, I don't know if you could end 2020 on with three better books than the Gospel of John, the Letters of John, and the book of Revelation. Um, uh, three books that most believe were written by the disciple John. Uh, Paul Metzger has written a book on, on, on the Gospel of John. It's entitled, uh, When Love Comes to Town. It is a, uh, the title comes from a song uh, by U2 uh, featuring B.B. King uh, singing it. And the singer sings about all his failures and confesses his sins and then has this line that he says over and over again in the song. And you can imagine B.B. King singing it. Uh, Maybe I was wrong to ever let you down, but I did what I did before love came to town. And uh, when love comes to town, everything changes. And, and, and I like Metzger's uh, title for the Gospel of John because that's exactly how John, the disciple, felt about Jesus. When, when Jesus came to town, everything for John changed, especially even his identity changed. Uh, we read in the Gospel of John, we read that uh, he doesn't ever call himself John. He doesn't call himself a disciple. You, you won't find John the disciple is mentioned in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke. But John's name as the disciple, he talks about John the Baptist, but not John the disciple, is never mentioned in the Gospel of John. Because John doesn't want to call himself John. You know what he calls himself? The one Jesus loved. What an identity. When love came to town, uh, John was no longer defined as a disciple or as an apostle or anything else he could think about. Who did he, who am I, John says? I'm the person that Jesus loved. What a way to define ourselves. Um, And so when he writes the Gospel of John, you see that. He talks about, we'll read this in the first chapter, he talks about what happens when love comes to town, when Jesus comes to town. And when you read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, there's no question. Uh, this writer writes as he teaches the church and Christians uh, what it is, how, how you should love, what it looks like to love, and what love is all about. And then in the book of Revelation, which you would think, well, well, the book of Revelation doesn't talk about love that much, does it? Well, in the book of Revelation, we find that, that love is not just a, a kindness, being nice to people. Love, as someone has said, is a fire. Uh, love is a passion uh, that will destroy anything that opposes love. And love ultimately will conquer all. Love ultimately will win. And uh, John writes through that vision that he saw one day when uh, I will wipe away all the tears from your eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Anything that stands opposed to God's love will eventually be destroyed so that God's love will reign forever. So what a great book to do. What a great books to study as we end the year. Uh, And so if you haven't, uh, if you haven't been following our devotionals, love to have you do that. If you've kind of gotten behind, which is very easy to do, uh, maybe now is the time to reset and just start again anew with with the gospel of John and follow along as we as we go through these uh, last three books. Um, But we're going to today we're going to look at John chapter one, verses one through 14. Such a powerful section that there's so much in here. We won't be able to talk about much of it, but we'll talk about just some of it. Uh, John 1, uh, beginning with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life And that life was the light of all mankind. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not out of natural descent or of a human decision or husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Lord, there are such powerful words that were written. Holy Spirit, would you bring to light what we need to hear? Would you reveal your glory to us through your word and through your spirit? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So John says that when Jesus came, he was full of grace and truth. I love that phrase, he was full of grace and truth. He was not 50% grace and 50% truth. He was 100% grace, he was 100% truth, 100% of the time. Uh, he did not alternate between truth and grace. He was not good cop, bad cop. <laughs> Sometimes we preachers do that. It seems like it's, it's very hard to be 100% grace and truth. And sometimes we preachers play good cop. And sometimes it seems like we're playing bad cop and alternate back and forth. But Jesus was that, was that combination, 100% grace, 100% truth. We try to wrap our minds around that. The best way I can say it, and these are basically uh, the two points of the sermon that I would have this morning is simply to say it this way. Grace without truth is not grace. And truth without grace is not truth. That, those two phrases speak to me a great deal. Grace without truth is not grace. And truth without grace is not truth. You can't have grace if you don't also have truth and you can't have truth if you also don't have grace 100% grace 100% truth Jesus came full of grace and truth and we need that today I mean is there anything that would change our world more than 100% grace and 100% truth which we believe is Jesus Christ the hope of the world, the hope of our world, our world that seems in such challenging uh, state. 19 years ago, we faced an attack from a foreign enemy. Many of us were alive. Many of us remember that Tuesday, that fateful Tuesday day. We can't forget it. And the days that followed afterwards. And I remember going to the book of Jeremiah as I was preparing to speak on that Sunday following that Tuesday and not, and not knowing what to say and, and, and really going to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 8 and 9, and the words were perfect. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed, the prophet says. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people oh that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears I would weep day and night for the slain of my people and and when I read that passage uh, immediately I understood what my response needed to be 
of mourning, of grief. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. Oh, that there would be some healing that would happen across our land. Oh, that there would be a physician that could heal us. Uh, that my eyes were a fountain of tears, that I would not fail to grieve, to correctly understand the loss that is going on. Grief is so important. Uh, And so um, those were perfect words that helped me understand our response, my response to that 9-11 event. This week, I, I reread that passage and realizing that today we, we also face a, a kind of a, a grief. Many people are experiencing grief of a variety of different kinds of grief. And our nation is facing a different challenge, not so much outside, but inside, a divided nation. And so I said, reread those words reflecting on 9-11 and, and reread those great passages. And then I went a little further in Jeremiah 9 and I read these words, verse 4. Beware of your friends. Do not trust anyone in your clan, for every one of them is a deceiver and every f- friend a slanderer. Friends deceive friend and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie. They weary themselves with sinning. You live in the midst of deception. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. And I thought, wow, Jeremiah, that sounds like our nation divided. Uh, Where we do not trust our neighbors. (laughs) We do not trust uh, people. One thing we all agree on as Americans is that we don't trust each other. And that we believe we live, as Jeremiah said, in the midst of deception. And I thought, wow, those are words that are so applicable to us today. And what we need, desperately need, to bring healing to our land is 100% grace and 100% truth. The grace and truth, the grace truth, you should say. Because grace without truth is not grace and truth without grace is not truth. The first one, grace without truth is not grace. Uh, Grace without truth uh, continues to allow evil and sin to, to reign. We need truth. The truth needs to be proclaimed so that victims will no longer continue to be victimized, so that tyrants will no longer continue to terrorize. We need truth. Or, or we hide behind propaganda. We hide behind lies. We need truth. And so truth is critically important for our nation. But not just truth about those who rule over us or those who make decisions, but truth about ourselves because we are very good at lying about, to ourselves. We are very good about believing our lies. We have an ability to to have willful blindness where we don't want to admit to the truth about ourselves. We want the world, we want our homes, we want our lives to be a certain way, and so uh, we can deceive ourselves, we can pretend. We can tell ourselves a narrative, a story, and we will try to choose facts that fit the story that we want to tell ourselves. And we've been doing that, as Jeremiah realizes, it's been going on since the beginning of time. Satan is the father of lies. We have been deceived. We know how to deceive. But there's something different about today. There's a more challenge today with truth, isn't there, because of the Internet, because of the social platforms that use algorithms to... uh, Gear, gear it so that I only hear what I want to hear and I only see what I want to see, that I can, I can limit uh, my exposure to just a very small, narrow way of thinking. Sophisticated formulas. So I can only see what I want to see and I can only hear what I want to hear. That just reinforce 
my narrative, which could reinforce my illusion and my deception. Paul warned Timothy about that. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, he says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Well, well we don't have to gather around. We get them gathered for us. Uh, if we have an itch in our ears... If we want to hear something, an itch to hear something, we can find someone out there that will scratch that itch for us. And so truth is a challenge in our world. There are some that would suggest there is no truth. That anyone who claims truth is just trying to use their power, trying to gain power. What we've been talking about in the last few weeks about how the, James says that we are to gaze intently into the perfect law of liberty. We are to gaze intently into the image of Jesus Christ, that mirror of Jesus Christ. And when we gain into the image of Jesus Christ, we see reality. We look at Jesus and then we see ourselves and we can see uh, the difference between Christ and who we are. We don't believe in the lies. We don't believe in a fantasy. We, we gaze into the mirror and see things the way they are. We see the truth. The truth, Jesus said, will set you free, but as someone said, uh, it may make you miserable first. <laughs> the truth is that we are sinners. That... Uh, as Isaiah said, we live, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. We recognize our sin. We recognize our need for repentance and confession. And so in truth, we refuse to sweep it under the rug. We refuse to pretend that it doesn't exist. We confess that. We allow the, the uh, penetrating spirit to s reveal truth to us because Jesus came and that's what Jesus did 100% grace, 100% truth he came and he refused to, to pretend, he refused to sweep sin under the rug, he confronted it, uh, he confronted sin in all its ugliness and all its horror because he was going to there to, he was there to solve the problems he did not treat sin lightly as Jeremiah talks about those false prophets in his day who treated sin as if it were not serious who put a band-aid on the deep wound he, Jesus came and confronted confronted the ugliness of sin and that's why he went to a cross in the cross we see the stark ugliness of sin the crucified Jesus who bears the sins of the world and becomes cursed for us in love he refuses to to cover over sin and to live in denial because grace without truth is not grace. And truth without grace is not truth. Without grace, we do not see truth. We think we see truth, but we do not see truth. If you do not have grace, you do not see truth. If you do not have love, if you do not look through the eyes of love, you are not seeing reality. You are not seeing truth because the most important truth of all is that God is love. That God loves us. And so without grace, we do not see truth. The word grace means, uh, in the Greek, it's the word charis. It means joy. It means rejoicing. Zephaniah says that the Lord rejoices over us with singing. That's what grace is. It is this, it is this joy. When, when someone sees you and they just rejoice over seeing you, it is being favored. Have you ever been favored? Have you ever been loved? Have you ever been chosen special? Um, I don't know if you would like this or not, but, but when our son Eric was young, I'll tell the story. We, he, we asked him what he thought about his new teacher, and he said, uh, my teacher loves me. And we thought, yes, that's what we want. Uh, 
That is grace, the joy, the love. Uh, John says, Jesus is the one, I, I am the one Jesus loved. That's what love does. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. We do not know truth unless we love. The word knowing in, in the Bible, the Greek word knowing that is most often used in the Bible is a, is a word for a relationship. It's not a word for head knowledge. We tend to think head knowledge. That I can know something by just staying objective. We have this idea, like a scientist, that we can objectively look at something without getting personally involved in it at all, and we can somehow believe that we know the truth. We know the person. But that is not the Bible understanding of know. When it talks about knowing the Lord or knowing someone, it's not that. It is an experiential relationship. Uh, and the ultimate knowledge in the Bible is this knowledge that comes from an intimate, loving relationship. That's knowing someone. You know someone when you love them. You may think you know my children, but you do not know my children if you don't love them. You don't know them because you haven't taken into account my love for my children and you haven't taken into account the love of the Father for the children that he created. That is, that is why Jesus and Paul and James spoke so often about not judging other people. They said it over and over again and they warned about judging so much because, because we tend to judge people we barely know. We tend to judge people from a distance. We, even, we judge people we despise. And we cannot judge correctly. We do not know truth without love. We do not truly see a person unless we see them through God's eyes. We think we know them. But truth without grace is not truth. John says Jesus came full of grace and truth, 100% full of grace and truth. And our world needs 100% grace and truth. And the world needs disciples of Jesus to be grace, truth people. Not good cop, bad cop, alternating back and forth. 100% grace, truth. And what I found, what you found, what I found, what people have found throughout history is that Though Jesus came full of grace and truth, it does not mean his followers are full of either. <laughs> Sometimes we are just full of it. <laughs> when I was in college, uh, many, of, many in, in Christian circles were upset uh, over Procter & Gamble. Some of you may remember this. Way back in the early 1980s, uh, Procter & Gamble uh, produces products they're out of Cincinnati uh, they produce laundry detergent toilet paper other things and and, and but back in the 80s uh, the, in the Christian circle uh, we were up in arms because we discovered that Procter and Gamble had a logo with satan satanic symbols on it and we were shocked to discover that the CEO of Procter and Gamble went on Phil Donahue remember Phil Donahue um, and uh, admitted that he gave money to a satanic church and he freely confessed it because he wasn't worried at all about Christians because there weren't enough Christians, serious Christians, who would care. Well, he was wrong. All oh, Christians, we got up in arms. Leaflets were sent out. Mailings were sent out. You didn't have internet back then. <laughs> uh, Procter & Gamble received 15,000 complaints <laughs> in a month, I think. Um, we will buy our laundry detergent somewhere else. Of course, later we found out it was all a lie. The symbol, which supposedly was satanic, had been around for a hundred years. Nothing satanic about it. The CEO never said anything like that on a talk show, never had been on a talk show. And several years later, in a lawsuit, Procter & Gamble was awarded $19.75 million dollars from four Amway distributors who spread some of those lies around. Who also sold laundry detergent. Hmm. 
Ed Stetzer has written a great book called Christians in the Age of Outrage. He says a few years ago, uh, Starbucks was under scrutiny. The red cup controversy. Reports were that Starbucks was removing Merry Christmas from their red cup, coffee cups, and people were outraged of it. Some were anyway. Only to find out later, of course, that Starbucks had never had Merry Christmas on their coffee cups at all. Stetzer writes these words. No, Starbucks did not hate Jesus. Starbucks employees were never told that they could not say Merry Christmas. But then he says, but of course, that's not their jobs anyway. It's our jobs as Christians to tell people about Jesus, not some barista. So why are we getting so upset? Jesus told us to love our enemies, not judge them or gossip about them, not spread rumors about them. We, we hold the truth. I mean, we, we follow the truth. And so we have to be very careful that we don't equate Jesus full of truth with necessarily us always being full of truth. That Jesus, the big truth, equates to all of my little truths being absolutely infallible. In our world today, those who claim to know truth are viewed with suspicion. Anyone who claims to know truth, they're just, they're just seeking power. Oh, um, and so of all times, in all times, we as Christians today, to reach our world, we need to speak the truth in love, and we need to speak the truth with humility. Which, by the way, I think is is one of the primary characteristics that Jesus was described with in Philippians 2, for instance. We must confess that Jesus is the truth, but that does not mean that my understanding about Jesus is infallible. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 that we know in part. We do. We have to admit that. We know in part. And so I must have humility uh, for the truth of Jesus is bigger than my conception of who Jesus is. Jesus is bigger than my conception of who he is. If, if I reduce Jesus down to my conception of who he is, then I am making him an idol. He's bigger. When I get done preaching, I, I probably should do a little bit like Job. At the end of the book of Job, where Job covered his mouth and said, uh, I have spoken of things too wonderful for me. I, I'm speaking of things that are beyond me. Understand that. May the Holy Spirit bring truth because, because we're talking about the glorious mysteries of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his book, Made to Stick, authors, uh, in their book, Made to Stick, authors, Chip and Dan Heath uh, tell the story, an interesting story of two researchers uh, way off in Australia who made an astonishing discovery. Uh, they found that ulcers were caused by bacteria. This is in the early 1980s. And up, in, up until that time, ulcers were created by too much, most people thought the conventional wisdom was that ulcers are created by too much uh, stomach acid and that you just kind of treated the symptoms by trying to reduce the stomach acid, maybe change what, what you eat. Um, but Barry Marshall and Robin Warren discovered that ulcers were create, caused by a bacteria, H. pylori is the name of the bacteria. And, and it was a great discovery, but no one believed them. It just made no sense. These were two relatively unknown researchers way off in Australia. And so no matter what they did, they couldn't get anyone to take notice of the fact that they had just made this great discovery. Until one day, Barry Marshall skipped breakfast. 
and met his lab partner in the lab and he chugged a glass filled with a billion H. pylori cells, bacteria. A few days later, guess what? Surprisingly, he was sick. He began to have the early stages of an ulcer. They did a scope, and sure enough, his stomach was red and inflamed. And then you know what he did. He began to treating himself with antibiotics and peptobismol. And it was discovered that indeed he was healed from that. It took about 10 years, but eventually now treating ulcers with antibiotics are as a standard practice. And I thought of that. I thought, yeah, that's, that's how you prove it, don't you? How do we convince a secular world that is growing more and more secular every day do we stand up on a platform and shout our view? Do, when people disagree with us, do we just get more angry and louder? Or do we embody what we believe? Do we become people full of grace and truth? That's what, that's what God did in Christ. He said, let me show you what it looks like to be human. Let me show you who God is. We are committed to the truth, but like those scientists, we cannot just talk about truth. We have to live it out. That's why Jesus was so strong against hypocrisy about people who talk a good game. That's why John in his epistle said, don't tell me how much you love God. If you can't love the brother and sister right in front of you, don't pretend like you love God if that love doesn't translate to other people because if God has loved you, and, and remember, John was the one who said, I'm the one Jesus loved. He experienced that love when love came to town. And John says, if, if God has really loved you as you say, and you have felt the Holy Spirit is in you, then it has to come out of you and if it doesn't come out of you then he says you are a liar you are deceiving yourselves and so if the cure doesn't work for us then why would anyone else believe it that's why Jesus said they will know you are my disciples by your love it seems that we can be very good at everything else but if we fail to love, then the world is going to never experience what happens when love comes to town. And so we have to be allow the cure to work for us. We have to be committed to the truth, not as it applies to everyone else, but we first and foremost have to be committed to the truth that it applies to us. We need to look and gaze into the mirror of Jesus Christ every day and gaze into that and allow that to be transformed. We cannot live in willful blindness to behaviors that are so destructive and somehow believe that we have the truth for other people. We have to come to grips with the truth because the truth is is both worse and better than we imagined. The truth is that we are sinners, but the truth is that God loves us. We are people full of truth and grace. We don't judge our enemies, we love them. We cannot know them until we love them. The cross is that perfect place where truth and grace intersect. And we see Jesus, what an example of someone who came to speak the truth, to witness to the truth. But notice how he did that. He did not try to force people to follow him. He did not try to control people with the truth that he knew was the truth. He did not use violence. He did not pick up the sword, which I think is so critical. You, in order to witness to the truth, we have to do it without violence. We have to do it without the sword. We have to do it without force. It corrupts the truth when we don't. Rather than inflict violence, he witnessed to the truth. He absorbed the violence. And he overcame it. 
People are suspicious of those who claim to know the truth. They, they know people who know the truth tend to be oppressive. Jesus came and said, let me show you the truth. Full of grace and truth. Unflinchingly witness to the truth. But also demonstrated to us the love of God. And so we are called to be those kind of disciples in a world that desperately needs grace, truth, people. Today, maybe there's someone out there who has never put their faith in Jesus Christ. Everything changes when love comes to town. He will come to live in your heart, bringing truth, grace to your heart. He will bring the truth, but he will bring the grace the grace that we are loved, the grace that we are favored. Some of us, we need to own up to the truth. Stop living in lies. Allow Jesus' power to transform the darkest places in our life, those rooms that we've kept hidden from Him. Open them up to Him. Confess those. No longer hide them. Let God's love and grace transform those places and he will make a miracle out of the places that we seem are the darkest, the worst. That's what his grace does. It specializes in that. Redemption, restoration, reconciliation. Some of you are ruthless in your search for self-truth. I know I'm speaking to some of you who are, you never want to be self-deceived. You are ruthless in your self-evaluation. You are, you critique every flaw, every word you speak. You don't boast, you don't brag. You never pretend that you're something you're not. You are ruthless and accept the brutal facts of all your flaws. But when we view ourselves through ruthless truth, devoid of God's grace, we also are missing the truth. We are not seeing the whole picture. The whole picture of you is not that you are flawed. God loves you. He favors you. He sees in you something so valuable, something so uh, priceless. And if you want to view yourself correctly, you also need to view yourself through God's love. He loves you. He will bring into your life 100% truth and 100% grace and set you free. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. I pray, Lord, today for the one who has never put their faith and trust in you. I pray like the disciple John experienced that they would find what happens when love comes to town. That they would let go of their uh, resistance, let go of the, of the things that they're holding on to and fa uh, afraid to let go of. That they will lose themselves in you and be redefined as people that Jesus loves. I pray that for the one that has never accepted you, that they would open their heart and receive salvation, receive your spirit now and the forgiveness of sins. And they would become new creations through the power of the spirit. Lord, I pray for them right now that they would receive you. And I pray, Lord, that they would testify to what you have done and begin this wonderful walk of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then, uh, Lord, I pray for, for those that are beaten and battered by their failures and they're overwhelmed uh, by all their flaws and the critique that they have constantly uh, put themselves under. Set them free from that, Lord. May we no longer view ourselves through other people's eyes or even through our self-critiquing eyes, but may we view ourselves through the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Father, that when you see something in us, it's not anger. You see something wrong in us. It's not so much anger that we get from you, but it is heartbrokenness. It is, it is love and compassion where you want to free us from anything destructive in our lives. Then, Father, I pray for us as disciples. We live in a broken world that desperately needs grace, truth of Christ. Holy Spirit, would you move upon us, move within us, fill our hearts with so much love that only love flows out from us, that when we speak the truth, we speak it with such grace and with such love that people see our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be the witnesses that we're called to be. May you do a good work through us and in us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And now just the doxology in closing. May God who puts all things together makes all things whole, who made a lasting mark through the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice of blood that sealed the eternal covenant, who led Jesus, our great shepherd, up and alive from the de dead. May this God put you together, provide you with everything you need to please him, make us into what gives him most pleasure by means of the sacrifice of Jesus the Messiah, to whom be all glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.